Hello, this is Tanner Dykin, pastor at Open Door Baptist Church. Uh, just doing another uh, review video of uh, another debate that I had with another uh, restorationist uh, teacher uh, named Todd Clippard. Uh, and it's been actually a while since I uh, had the debate. Uh, and the reason that I, I haven't done a review of it yet uh, is, uh, to be quite honest, uh, I've just I've just not felt uh, in the mood to do it. Uh, I, I had other things uh, on my plate. Uh, I've been fairly busy since then, and uh, you know every time the opportunity uh, presented itself to me where where I might have done it, uh, I just I just didn't really you know feel in the mood to uh, do it. Uh, and my apologies uh, for that. Uh, and uh, I'm doing it now. So. Uh, you know, better late than never. Uh, and like I said, this this happened uh, a little while ago. And, uh, you know, Todd Clippard, uh, I'll just say again that, that he was uh, as nice as could be. Uh, he was as accommodating as uh, anyone else. And, uh, and I, you know, I, I like him as, as a person. He, he, he's, he's a decent man. Um, Nonetheless, we, we do have some deep disagreements uh, between us, and it came out during uh, the debate. And, uh, you know, so I, I wanted to, to start uh, another uh, review uh, series on this, just to, to bring out some points that we didn't really get the time to go over during the debate, and uh, I might not have been able to, to thoroughly interact with what he had said. Uh, but uh, with that, I'll just go on ahead and jump into this. I'm going to try and make these a lot shorter than the last one. And so I'll, uh, I'll start, uh, I'll go ahead and start off. Uh, for the first argument, I'm not going to play what he said uh, just for the sake of time. It was about the first 10 minutes of his opening statement on the first night. Uh, and it consisted, and this was his primary argument for the first night, uh, it consisted of two Old Testament uh, examples that he took to be uh, establishing a pattern which the New Test which New Testament uh, salvation New Covenant uh, salvation uh, is patterned after and uh, and, and thus uh, involves works as a, a means of our justification or a, a requirement for our justification. And I have it up here on the screen. The first uh, example he used was Moses and the uh, fiery serpents in Numbers 11, where Israel was disobedient to God. God sent fiery serpents to judge them. The people were dying because of them. And uh, Moses was told to lift up a bronze serpent so that anybody who was bitten by a serpent could look to that image and uh, they would be cured from the snake bite. And uh, he parses this out as he does the other example that first God had grace towards the people. Uh, then uh, God gave a law and, and he sort of parsed it out that, that God graciously gave a law that the people were told to obey by uh, obey in a faithful way toward him in order for them to have a reward, which in this case was not dying by the, the serpents. Uh, and so he, he tried to establish this pattern uh, in Numbers 21. Uh, the second example he used uh, was Joshua chapter 6 and uh, the walls of Jericho. Of course, we know the story. Uh, learned it in Sunday school uh, that the uh, children of Israel, having crossed over the River Jordan, were told to go and take the city of Jericho. Jericho was a walled city. It had strong defenses. And uh, they were told to go and walk around the city uh, for you know so many times in so many days. And on the seventh day, that they would blow the trumpets and shout and the walls would fall and God would give to them the city. And uh, uh, Todd parses this out in the same way as the last one, that God graciously gave a law that was walking around the city, that they were to obey by faith 
uh, in, in a faithful fashion uh, in order to obtain uh, the reward, which was the conquering of the city. And what Todd essentially did here was he took this pattern that he established from the Old Testament and he imports it into the New Testament as uh, in, in, into our doctrine of salvation uh, in order to say this is the same way that God has ordained to save. Uh, that God is gracious towards us in that he gives us a law or that he gives us grace in order to obey the law that he gives graciously and that by working out that law through faith we obtain the reward. We are given the reward on those conditions. And so, uh, you know, here, this is what he's uh, you know, saying that 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 the in his case, uh, the law would be uh, baptism. The law would be doing Christian uh, works of charity or, or or something like that. That is Christian works of love. Um, you know, doing uh, the the Christian life uh, uh, confession of sins. Uh, perhaps taking of the uh, table of the Lord when. A meeting together with the church, serving in the church, uh, those kinds of things. Uh, that these works, however he would parse out the works that are necessary to be saved, uh, fit in to this pattern that he established. Um, the problem is, when he does this, he largely does it without explicit justification. Uh, he, he basically says, okay, I can establish this pattern in the Old Testament here. And because I can do that, I'm going to import that first into the doctrine of justification, into the doctrine of how we are made righteous before God, and bring that into the New Covenant context, uh, that, that when we are saved by Christ, we attain to uh, the requirements of being saved by Christ through works, and uh, and thus we we receive justification. Um, and the problem is again, he he just largely does this without justification, and I'll I'll, I'll show you that um, here in a minute. But I'd like to uh, you know go to each one of these and, and kind of show. Uh, where he's got off base. And this is useful uh, because any of us could end up doing this at any time. Uh, when we go to the scripture and we go, uh, say, to the Old Testament, it's, it's fairly easy when we begin to allegorize things to, to get off base. And we have to be very careful when we do and only do it where the scripture uh, heavily you know, leans us in that way and only in a scripturally consistent way. Uh, and so I'd like to just look at uh, Numbers chapter 21 in the Fiery Serpents. And, uh, you know, he, he uses it as an allegory. Uh, the scripture also uses it as an allegory. And I'd like us to look at where it's used and see, uh, see whether his allegorization is consistent with the scripture's allegorization. Uh, Jesus himself actually was the one who used it as an allegory for salvation in him. And he used it in John 3, verse 14. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. So here is Jesus' own understanding of the serpent that was lifted up in the wilderness. You'll notice that the act of the serpent being crafted and lifted up in the wilderness is not used by Jesus as an allegory for how we do works in order to be saved. So there's one element that is inconsistent with uh, one way, at least, that, that Todd's interpretation might be inconsistent with Jesus Christ's. Uh, because the serpent being lifted up is an image of how Jesus gave himself as a sacrifice. And we all understand that we did not participate 
in God, in Jesus' self-giving on the cross, that, that it was not something that we did. It was something that he voluntarily did. He gave of himself. We did not contribute to the atonement on the cross. Jesus Christ did that all on his own by the working of the Father. Uh, and so there's one uh, element where we can say that that is not telling us that we have to work in order to be uh, saved. Well, what about the other element, that the people looked to the serpent? Well, Jesus gives us uh, an explanation for that as well, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. So the serpent is lifted up, and the people look to it. And what is Jesus' explanation for uh, what the people looking to the serpent signifies? He shows it as being belief, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. It's kind of a physical representation of faith in this allegory that, that Jesus is drawing from the Old Testament, this sign that he's drawing from the Old Testament, uh, is that looking is faith. He doesn't call it a work. He doesn't call it uh, something that we do by effort. Rather, he says that it's belief. It's something that we believe on Jesus. Uh, and this is consistent, and perfectly consistent with sola fide. Uh, there's nowhere that, that draws the parallel that because the uh, uh, the Israelites had to turn their neck because they might have had to shift position a little bit uh, in order to actually look and see the serpent. That therefore we have to do works and, and work it up in ourselves to uh, to be saved. And so uh, this you know image of the serpent uh, is is not a good allegory, it, and it's not a good use of uh, it's not a good use of this biblical allegory. Uh, the, the, the use that Todd is trying to make of it is, is abiblical. It's, it's, it's not in keeping with uh, faithful interpretation. Well, what about Joshua and uh, the city of Jericho, the children of Israel doing that? Well, I'd just like to ask right from the get-go, were these people doing this? Was the children of, were the children of Israel doing this in order to become the covenant children of God, the covenant people of God, or were they already the people of God? And this applies to the last uh, item as well, the serpent. Uh, in the case of the serpent, they were already, of course, his people. Uh, they had already gone through the Red Sea. God had already declared and he had promised that he would be their God. They would be his people. In the case of Jericho, the new generation had also already been initiated into the covenant uh, uh, relationship with God. They had already walked through the uh, Jordan River. They had already all been uh, circumcised. They had set up the memorial. Uh, they were already the covenant people of God. And so what we see in Jericho is not that they were doing this in order to be his covenant people or in order to receive forgiveness of their sins uh, or anything like that. We're never given uh, any warrant for making that uh, connection between Jericho and the forgiveness of sins, salvation through Christ. Uh, you know, in fact, I would say that uh, Jericho and the way that it's also used um, in the New Testament uh, in uh, Hebrews chapter 11 is, um, is, is not in a way that lends itself to uh, taking it as justification. Uh, this is another point of disagreement between Todd and I, but Hebrews 11 uh, is all about showing that our faith is genuine. All of the people that are talked about in uh, Hebrews 11 uh, are demonstrating to the world that they are uh, heirs of the promise. Uh, they are gaining a good report before the world. Uh, and by their uh, doing these things, uh, by their being uh, faithful to God and, and trusting 
in God. Uh, their trust drives them to do various things, uh, and they are vindicated by them. Uh, it, it's, it's not about how they obtained righteousness. There, there's nothing about uh, obtaining uh, you know, the righteousness of Christ, being justified by works in Hebrews 11. And in the same way, there's nothing in the book of Joshua about going around Jericho and being justified by this. Rather, what we have is that because they obeyed what God told them to do, that is to go and take the city of Jericho, they received the city of Jericho, a temporal blessing on God's people, not the blessing of eternal salvation. And so again, where there is no warrant to uh, interpret these passages in this way, these stories in this way, uh, then I think that we should speak where the scripture speaks and stop speaking where the scripture stops speaking. Uh, and uh, the fact that, that Todd basically hung his entire argument from the first night on these two passages, um, it, it, was, it was really underwhelming. When he, and like I said, he's He's a good guy. He's a nice guy. Uh, you know, I, 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 I wouldn't mind being around him more often, you know. Uh, but as far as these arguments go, they, they really didn't persuade me. And uh, I think that they're just, they were just not biblical uh, uses of those passages. Uh, anyway, uh, we'll just uh, move right along now. Uh, we're already nearly 20 minutes into this, and so I'll just uh, go forward. Uh, I'll play this next uh, segment where he goes to uh, John chapter 8. And uh, in John chapter 8, I had used the passage, uh, you know, a year of your father, the devil, the lusts of your father, ye shall do, and whosoever sinneth is a servant of sin, to, to demonstrate total depravity, that he that sins is the servant of sin. He cannot disobey sin. He that sins is of his father, the devil, and he does the lusts of his father. It's a description of what he does out of his sinful nature. Without Christ, we are all like this. Uh, and Todd uh, is going to uh, try to uh, refute this idea with an observation from the context. 105 after that, but since 5104. I, I, should, probably, um, I should probably note at this point that I, I've sped up his uh, speech uh, a little bit uh, in order to, uh, to, to listen through him you know, just a little faster, just to uh, get through this faster. Yeah. With regard to John chapter 8, uh, Tanner made reference to a couple of verses in this text. One of them was in uh, verse 34, Most assuredly, I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. And then later down in verse 44, he said, You are of your father, the devil, and his desires you want to do. Now, now Tanner took these two verses and used them to try to teach the doctrine of total depravity, total inability to. Uh, to to believe in God or respond to God uh, in any positive or favorable way. But Tanner needs to go back in the text, back to verse number 30. These people of whom Jesus said just simply made a statement, you are of your father earth, that whoever commits sin is the slave of sin, and you are of your father the devil. What does the, what does the inspired record say of these people? In John 8 verse 30 it says, Then Jesus said to those Jews, that's verse 31, excuse me, verse 30, he spoke these words, many believed in him. Then, verse 31, Jesus spoke or said to those Jews who believed in him. And then in verse 33, they answered him. So the group of people that are under consideration here in John 8 and 34 and John 8, 30, or John 8, 36, John 8, 44, are clearly spoken of twice in the immediate context as those who believed in Jesus. Now, in, in uh, uh Slide 105, please, as we move uh, from there. We ask this question with regard. Uh, we ask this question with regard to uh, total depravity. Uh, did these or do these people? Uh, 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 are they believers or are they totally depraved, as Tanner has affirmed? So John, the inspired writer, says these are people who believed in Jesus, and he said it twice. Now, are they totally depraved 
or are they believers like the text says? So are they believers as the text says, or are they totally depraved as Tanner says? In this case, I will choose what the text says over what Tanner says. Uh, there's nothing in this verse that it, it even remotely implies uh, total depravity. In fact, there is not one text anywhere in the Bible that says that man is totally depraved. Now, I want to look at what Tanner said with regard to Ephesians chapter. All right. So uh, there, um, you know, I'll just go back a little there. Uh, there was um, his response to my use of uh, John chapter 8. And, uh, you know, uh, basically what he's saying uh, is that because verse 30 says that there were some, that there were many uh, th but that believed on him, and in verse 31, that there were some Jews which believed on him. Uh, you know, uh, that because of that in the passage, because some had believed, that therefore what Jesus says about the nature of unbelievers is uh, is is not that they're totally depraved. I just first like to to say that just because the Bible says that some people believe on Jesus, just because it affirms that, just because we see in narrative that some people do come to faith in Jesus Christ, does not mean that they were therefore not totally depraved beforehand, right? All this is, all, all that that means is that they believed, right? We, we believe that Paul the Apostle believed. We believe that Peter believed. Uh, we believe that, um, uh, that Ananias believed, that the Ethiopian eunuch believed. Uh, just because the Bible affirms that some people had faith in Christ does not mean that total depravity is incorrect. Uh, all right, and uh, to make that kind of argument does not does not help because those of us who believe in total depravity, of course, we know that people believe. Of course, we know that people have faith. Of course, we know that in the course of Scripture, some people come to Jesus Christ for salvation. The question is, were they able to do that before God worked in them? How was it that they came to saving faith? I made the case in, uh, in my opening statement on that night that uh, the way a person comes to faith in Christ is that, of course, we are depraved. Of course, we can't come by our own selves. But when God chooses to work, when he brings to spiritual life, we will believe on Christ. It, it, it almost seems just on the face of it kind of silly to point in the general context that, oh, some people believed. And I'll, I'll show why I don't think that's being used in that way in this passage. But even if it were, um, that, that some people believed that therefore men are not totally depraved it, it just doesn't it's not hearing the argument is is you know what i'm saying and so uh yes they believed we'll, we'll just say for the moment that they had genuine faith doesn't hurt the argument but now let's look and see that contextually i think that what's happening is not that they have genuine saving faith in christ but rather, they have a kind of earthly faith or an earthly trust in the same kind of way that some people might have faith in a politician or in a military leader or in a public figure of some kind. They had a kind of trust in them or, or a desire to be associated with them in that kind of earthly way. And I think that there's contextual clues to tell us about this. Uh, first, as I noted in the debate, the aorist is used here, and uh, it's been noted by many theologians throughout history that John uses the aorist tense in order to tip us off that these people are, are having an earthly kind of faith, not a saving faith, not an enduring faith, but they just want to be associated with Christ because they think he's going to be a military leader or because he's a big figure in that day. But we also see 
that because of what Jesus says to those that believed, those that had this kind of faith, uh, that we see contextually that they did not have genuine faith. You'll notice that Todd stopped before he got to the middle of verse 31. Uh, uh, then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Uh, first, what we have is, uh, if ye continue in my word. This is, a, this is future tense, of course. If ye continue in it. If from this moment on, you continue to hear and obey what I'm saying to you, then what? Then present tense, are ye my disciples indeed? What he's saying is that if you want to demonstrate to us that your trust in me, your desire to be associated with me, if you want to show us that it's genuine, you have to continue in my words. You have to follow me, right? That's not to say necessarily that in the moment they are not his disciples by faith, but rather in order to demonstrate that they are his disciples, they have to do something. They have to continue in his word, right? And this, you know, again, is, is not something that the, uh, the, the reformed uh, doctrine, the, 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 the doctrines of grace, as they've been called, uh, denies. We, we understand that there isn't, that, that all those who God calls to faith in Christ will persevere in faith in him. And so he's saying, if you continue, then we know you're my disciples. And the converse of this is, if you do not continue, then we know you are not my disciples. Then we know that from the beginning you were not, you were, you did not have saving faith in Christ. And what do we see by the end of the chapter? In verse 59, then took they up stones to cast at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. And even between those two places, they, uh, they had already grown weary with him. So even before the chapter is over, they had already demonstrated that in the moment, they did not have saving faith. They had an earthly faith. They were not trusting in him to for, for forgiveness of their sins. Uh, they had believed that he was a military leader. They had believed that he was the next big thing. And so they wanted to associate themselves with him. And so by this, they demonstrate that while they believed in an earthly kind of sense, nonetheless, they, they did not have saving faith in him. And so uh, here, uh, what Todd says um, it is, it, is, is not keeping with the, the context, what Jesus says, how Jesus is identifying them uh, in the narrative structure, and how, of course, John is inspired to write down how Jesus is uh, talking about them. And so uh, with that, we'll go on to what he's going to say about Ephesians chapter 2. What Patter says, uh, there's nothing in this verse that it, it even remotely implies uh, total depravity. In fact, there is not one text anywhere in the Bible that says that man is totally depraved. Now, I want to look at... Uh, just a, a quick note again, um, is uh, that, that John chapter 8, you know, he just said, uh, he just said that there's no text that implies uh, total depravity. I think that what we've just seen in John chapter 8 just just shows us that John chapter 8 is all about human depravity. It's all about how these people in the sinfulness of their heart wanted to associate with Christ, thinking that he was going to give them the kingdom without forgiveness of their sins because they didn't think they needed any. And uh, that uh, because of, of that, as soon as he starts to speak against them, uh, they hate him. They don't want to come to him. 
Uh, that is what the depraved heart is. It does not want Christ at all. As soon as Christ turns and begins to rebuke for sin and, and to call to repentance, uh, the depraved heart turns up its nose, it turns its back, and when it turns back around, it has murder in its eyes. That's what happens in John chapter 8. And uh, so we, we've just seen that. That said, with regard to Ephesians chapter 2 in his defense of total depravity, and I want to go to slide 110. Because Tanner says that because we are dead in our sins and trespasses, we are totally unable to do anything in regard to our, our uh, spiritual condition. And so we ask with regard to Ephesians 2, 1 to 3, does this text teach total depravity? Does dead in sin and trespasses mean total inability? And, and so we would ask, well, what does the Bible say about the word dead? Uh, note, uh, for example, in, uh, in uh, uh, slide uh, 110 here, does, does a dead mean total inability? Sleep is a euphemism for death in the New Testament. Jesus spoke of Lazarus uh, being asleep in John 11, 11. Uh, He said Lazarus was dead in John 11, 13. Paul used these two terms interchangeably uh, with regard to uh, 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 those that were asleep in Christ and those who are dead in Christ, using the terms sleep and dead interchangeably. Then in slide uh, 1, 11, we find that Paul uses the terms interchangeably in 1 Corinthians 15, 50. Right, 50 and 51, 52, speaking of we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. He's talking about death there. And then in verse 52, he says the dead in Christ. And so he uses those terms interchangeably there with regard uh, to uh, total uh, uh, to uh, death and sleep. But in 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 30, we find where in our next slide, slide, I believe 111 or 112, that, uh, that Paul spoke of those Christians who were weak and sick and many sleep. Now, he's talking to Christians. He's talking to members of the church at Corinth, and he says, some of you are weak, some of you are sick, and many of you sleep. Now, uh, with uh, regard to go to our next slide, with regard to... Um, uh, I'll just pause it right here. Uh, what he's uh, trying to do here is he's trying to show that because the word sleep is used in the scripture sometimes as a locution for death, Sometimes as a euphemism or, or uh, you know, a way of talking about death without being so blunt about it, uh, that therefore we we put into question the word death in Ephesians chapter two as to what death means, and this is a, a really confused uh, way of doing word studies uh, or, or or a way of doing semantic analysis. What he's basically doing is he's saying that because the word sleep has a certain semantic domain, that it can mean sometimes in some contexts death, and sometimes it can mean, uh, sometimes it can mean uh, just sleep, you know, just rest taking, uh, or some other things sometimes, you know, uh, mental, like blindness, like you, you're blind to something, you're asleep. Uh, you, you, you do not perceive something if you're asleep. Those kinds of ideas. That because sleep is used in this way, and because in some contexts where sleep is being used as a locution for death, the word death is also used, that therefore we can take all of what the word sleep means and import it into the semantic domain for the word death, and that therefore puts into question whether Ephesians chapter 2 may mean, uh, may simply mean unconsciousness, may simply mean uh, the taking of rest or the, uh, uh, you know, uh, some kind of a, a blindness to certain things, an, an inability to, to kind of perceive certain things, but not complete inability to do anything. And I think that we can all see that that's, that's misguided. That's, that's, a, that's a misguided way of, of an, analyzing what words mean. That would be like using the word destroy. Uh, say somebody is getting ready to eat and they say, I'm going to destroy that steak, right? I'm going to destroy that steak. Uh, that you can then take... Uh, all of and and using that as sort of a locution for I'm going to eat vigorously, right? 
that, they, that therefore you can use all of the uh, all of the different meanings for the word destroy and take every meaning literal meaning for the word destroy and bring it into the word for eat and say the eat means to uh, to to pull down a city that I eat a city I, I pull it down like like you might say I destroy a city well you can just say I eat a city I uh, I destroy my car. I destroyed my car in an accident, right? Well, I ate my car in an accident. Uh, this kind of use of, of taking the semantic domain of one word and importing it wholesale into another word for which it is sometimes used as a locution, right, uh, is, is, again, not ideal. And, and really, is, it, it does nothing to demonstrate that the way the word uh, death is being used in Ephesians chapter 2 is not death, that it's not inability to do anything. We all understand that, that, that death is not being used in its uh, normal or, or, or directly literal way. They're, of course, still up and walking around. They're still physically doing things. But we understand in the context it's being used spiritually, right? That spiritually they cannot do that which is pleasing to God, right? Uh, and especially I, 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 I emphasized also some of these other terms that are used in that context, uh, that they were children of, we were children of disobedience, we walked after the course of this world. Uh, we walked after the prince of the power of the air. We were by nature children of wrath, right? Uh, and this is more than simply saying that we uh, we were sort of muted in our capacity or our ability to perceive or something like that. Um, it's it's more than that. It, it is spiritual death in sin. Uh, but. Uh, we'll go ahead and we'll let him continue. And he has two passages he'll bring up here in a moment. These Christians says, if they were weak and sick, then what is the state of those who were said to sleep? Now, if they were dead, as the text, or as Tanner would say, they're dead, they're totally unable to do anything, then could they respond as being asleep, being dead? Could they respond to Paul's correction and repent? Or must God make them alive through a direct and irresistible operation of the Holy Spirit. And just to, to drive this... And I just, I'll, I'll just make another mention here. That in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, where he's taking this from, that, that many sleep, of course he's talking about literal death, right? He's not saying to those who are in the ground, you know, cold and dead, repent. He's not saying that to them. You know, they're dead. What he's saying to them are those who are alive, right? Those who, who are still in the church, right? Uh, this doesn't, again, this is, this is a kind of argument that just doesn't hold any water once you kind of think about what he's saying. A little bit more. Look at slide 113 with regard to what Paul says about young widows. He says, the young widow is said to be dead while she lives. Now, can that young widow repent of her sin? Or is she totally unable to repent of the sins that, that she has committed or is committing as uh, enumerated there in 1 Timothy 5? And then finally, we have a church in slide 114, a church that was spoken of as being alive, but they were dead. The church at Sardis, Revelation chapter 3 and verse number 2, uh, Jesus said to this church, you have a name that you are alive, but you are dead. And we ask the question, could those folks in that church repent or were they totally unable were they possessed with total inability because of their deadness. And so Tanner has, has taken this word dead in Ephesians chapter 2, and he has stretched it way beyond the intent of the writer and way beyond the usage uh, that we find in the New Testament. And um, you know, once again, I'll just, I'll just note briefly um, that here he is going to other contexts. He's not looking directly at Ephesians chapter 2. He's trying to, to build up a, a sort of an argument that the, the semantic domain of the word dead may 
you know, in, in the spiritual sense here may not mean completely unable, right? Uh, but he is going outside of the context of Ephesians 2, and he's not actually looking at the context of Ephesians 2 to discern whether, even if death may mean that, right, not, uh, you know, totally unable, that, that they have some ability of themselves, uh, even if it could mean that, he is not giving an argument why it should be taken in the context that he's looking at. And that's also necessary. I, I, we have kind of an incomplete argument that's being given here. But the two uh, passages that he uh, looked at were, uh, of course, in the, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 5, uh, that she that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth, in verse 6. And uh, basically what he was saying here is that, uh, well, uh, these uh, widows uh, in the that were in the church or that were trying to uh, enter into the church to work for the church in order to uh, make a living, uh, that if they live in pleasure, that they are dead while they live, right? And what he's trying to say is that these are uh, believers, that these are, are uh, uh, saved individuals, that they are have been uh, justified, and yet they are called dead while they live, right? Um, he didn't go to the context and show us why he believes that these are believers. Uh, and we even see that th the context seems to indicate directly otherwise, that these are people, these are women who were trying to use the church. They were trying to, to kind of, uh, because their husbands had died, they were trying to, to find an easy life uh, so that they can continue to live in their pleasures uh, and and kind of mooch off the church in, in, instead of, of uh, going and uh, seeing about uh, their lives of pleasure on their own. They were trying to steal from the church in this way. So they were living in pleasure. They were dead while they live. In verse 11, they have begun to wax wanton against Christ, or, or rather, when they have begun to wax wanton against Christ. Uh, and this is, you know, of course, uh, the, the same attitude as living in pleasure, uh, not caring for Christ, being wanton against Christ, that they, in verse 12, have damnation because they have cast off their first faith, because they have associated with Christ, because they have associated with the church for their own gain and yet then they have cast it off to live in pleasure they have damnation on themselves and for some in verse 15 are already turned aside after satan they've already turned away from the church to pursue after satan so what we have here is we have individuals who are not genuine believers they have come in and tried to use the church and Paul is warning Timothy about this. He's saying, do not take these in. Do not take anyone in under this certain age because they, uh, they are prone to this, to using the church and not, uh, and not being genuinely uh, involved in the church and, and, and loving Christ and desiring to please him. Uh, they are already turned aside after Satan. And so uh, I think here we, we don't really have an example of uh, believers being called dead while they live, right? And uh, just because, again, just because we see a call to repentance does not mean that a person is able of themselves to work up repentance and turn. We know that repentance is a gift from God. That, that, that uh, you know, it, God has to grant repentance. We read that in 2 Timothy. Uh, Peradventure, God will grant them repentance uh, to the acknowledging of the truth. Uh, it's something that God does, something that God gives. So just the call to repentance does not negate the idea that it is a gift of God. The uh, second passage he used is in uh, Revelation chapter 3. In verse 1, uh, speaking to the church in Sardis, uh, thy, uh, that thou hast a name, that thou livest, uh, 
and aren't dead. So he's talking to a congregation and he's saying, you have a name that you live and are dead. And I'll first say that, of course, he's not using the word death of the same um, the same object as uh, as he is in Ephesians chapter two. Um, in Ephesians chapter two, he is speaking of individuals uh, that that you were individually children of wrath, you were individually dead in trespasses and sins. Um, and here he is talking of a body, of a congregation, a church, and uh, you know we can simply say that on a whole, a church may be dead that they may not have the the, uh, the active principle that drives them out into the world to do uh, good works. And this is, uh, you know, evident in verse 2. I have not found thy works perfect before God. And so we can simply take this to mean a, a, a different kind of, of a context for deadness as Ephesians chapter 2, a sort of corporate deadness instead of individual deadness. Um, but... I think that we have a, a, a good argument here for uh, thinking that most of those who were in this congregation were not regenerate, that there were only a few that were, and they are the ones that are being instructed. The, the, the ones who, who are regenerate are told to strengthen themselves because the, the, the congregation as a whole has become uh, has, has, has not become a congregation of regenerate persons. Um, of course, because, you know, thou hast a name that thou livest and art dead, and they're told to uh, repent, uh, you know, the, the, to remember what thou hast received and heard and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Uh, he, he, he says that he will, um, you know, he, he'll, he'll, uh, you know, he'll, he'll, he'll take away uh, their spot uh, and uh, as being a church. And uh, yet in verse four, he says, thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment. Uh, what he's saying here to the church, to the broad church in Sardis, is that you are dead, that, that you need to repent. That is, you need to be forgiven of your sins. Remember what has been delivered to you. Remember the gospel that's been delivered to you. And do not neglect it any longer, but repent and uh, hold fast to it and you know, be saved. Otherwise, he will come on them quickly. He, he will, he will uh, you know, come on them to, to, to take away their status of being a church. Uh, but there are a few in the town, in Sardis, which are faithful, which are genuine. Um, and uh, I think that this is perfectly, perfectly consistent with, with the usage in Ephesians chapter 2. Uh, that, that, that on a whole the church is dead, unregenerate, but even there there are some that are uh, holding up the fort. There, there is just enough faithful in Sardis to say that there is still a church there, uh, even though if, if most of those who call themselves Christian in, in Sardis are not Christians. They're just there for various reasons, countercultural, you know, uh, kind of social club, uh, that they uh, they want a platform to to go out and be uh, you know speak against their their uh, city to to moralize from to do whatever uh, even back then they had false church members and uh, so I, I think that that here we have not two examples which and again not in the context of Ephesians two but even in these two passages, we don't see anything that would count, contradict the use of death in Ephesians chapter 2. Uh, there's one final argument that he makes, and, and I want to, to really, uh, really uh, hit on this before I end. I'm already coming up on an hour, and uh, hopefully uh, I'll uh, go through and 
uh, there hopefully won't be too much more that I want to uh, to look at from the first night. Uh, but we'll go ahead and, and we'll look at his final argument. And I really want to hit on this one. Now uh, to uh, Tanner's statement. And uh, I believe just for the sake of time, uh, let uh, Ben know this will be the last. Uh, we won't have any more slides uh, through the last four or five minutes of our discussion tonight, or at least in this opening section. But, uh, but uh, Tanner says that regeneration precedes any action on man's part. Now, the Bible says that we're saved by faith. But Tanner says that we are we have faith because we're saved. See, there, there's, a, there's a, words mean things. Now, the Bible says that we are that we are saved by faith, or that we have salvation by faith and through faith. But Tanner says we have faith through salvation. Now, what does the Bible say about this matter of of uh, regeneration or being born again? In First Peter chapter one and verse twenty-two, uh, Peter writes to those brethren. He says, "Seeing then that you have purified your souls by obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love for the brethren." Love one another with pure heart, fervently being born. I'm just going to skip forward here. I thought that this was the next thing that he said, but uh, again, that's a thing Paul says. But God be thanked that when you were the servants, oh, of, when is. were they born again? When they obeyed the truth through the Spirit. In Romans chapter six and verse seventeen, Paul says, "But God be thanked that when you were the servants of sin, you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered to you, being then made free from sin." When? When were they made free from sin? When they obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine. And then being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. And so being made free from sin and being made the servants of righteousness comes after obedience to the doctrine of Christ and not before. And time does not permit us to get into John 3, 3 and 5. If we don't get into it uh, tonight, I'm sure that we'll discuss it tomorrow in our discussion of baptism. But uh, our time for this session is done. There'll be just a brief period of, of, of interlude or commercials as I get out of the chat room and we get Tanner back in. Let me thank you again. All right. Uh, so that's, uh, you know, that's the, the last thing I wanted to say, uh, you know, to, to look at, um, you know, the, the, the passage in uh, First Peter there, I had, uh, I've already addressed in, in that debate and in the debate with Matt. But uh, and I did address Romans chapter six in uh, our, my debate with with Todd, uh, I think perhaps both nights, maybe uh, if I recall right, uh, I think I, I touched on it a little bit. Uh, but the, the the passage that he's he's looking at here is uh, Romans six chapter seventeen. But God be thanked that you were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. Now, um, it's an interesting, uh, there's, there's a, uh, there's an interesting thing here that I, I, I didn't know, uh, before the debate, I, I didn't know, uh, you know, going into the debate about this, but subsequent to the debate, I, uh, you know, I, I went through and, and I was doing some study and, uh, I, I read something very interesting in a commentary that I, I wanted to share here. And, uh, you know, I would have noted in the debate had I had I known this, but, you know, I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not prideful enough to say that uh, that I, I'll never learn, uh, you know, anything new. And uh, this is one of those times where I've learned something uh, a little bit new and it, it, it seems to make uh, pretty good sense to me. Uh, but I did say in the debate uh, that in verse 18, uh, this is not necessarily a statement of that they obeyed from the heart and then thus they were made free from sin. Uh, that the, the, the word here, uh, you know, that, that they were then made free from sin does not necessarily mean uh, and, uh, that, they, that they were made free from sin because of obedience, right? But it could, it could just be a statement that they were made free from sin, right? But uh, an interesting uh, note about verse 17 uh, is the word peredodite, uh, peredodite, uh, and I'm probably butchering that pronunciation there, uh, but it's essentially the word that means, uh, you know, that, that something was delivered, right? Something was delivered over. Uh, so it would be in the, in the King James here, the rendering, ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. So it's, it's, it's about being delivered. Uh, in verse 17, the, the 
uh, the, the grammar is a little weird in verse 17. Um, it's, it's not as straightforward as some other uh, passages in the chapter. Um, and the, the, the word there for delivered um, has the connotation of, of the transfer of custody, right? Of being delivered up, delivered to some. To, to, to the charge of someone it, it can it can have this connotation to it um so in in uh you know say the slave trade right in in that day when somebody bought bought a slave uh the former owner would deliver up the slave to them that they had bought and I, I read this in, in Tom Schreiner's commentary on, on Romans. Uh, he thinks that, that the passage is better understood that the doctrine is not the thing that's being delivered up, right? But rather, it's the believer that's being delivered up. It's, it's, the, 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 uh, it's the people of God who are being delivered up. Uh, that it would be something like, Ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered, right? That, that, that what has happened is that they were the servants of sin, but God be thanked that he delivered you from sin up to this doctrine. So he is the one that freed you from sin and delivered you to the doctrine that you are obeying, right, is, is kind of the idea here. Uh, and being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. So the priority here would be different, right? It would be flipped. And, and in the whole context, we see that the, 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 the dominating motif is that of slavery. And so it, it's natural to take that... Uh, the, the object of deliverance, of, of, of being delivered up, is not the form of doctrine, but rather the believer, rather the, 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 the one who is being saved from sin. And that this, of course, is done by God, because God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which ye were delivered right to, to which you were delivered up to uh, that God he, he freed you from sin and he delivered you to this form of doctrine and then you obeyed it not before not in order to be delivered but because you were delivered you obeyed and uh that's something that I wanted to get in here. I thought it was interesting. It's something that uh, I'll uh, probably mention uh, going forward uh, whenever this passage is um, is presented as uh, evidence of uh, salvation by works. Uh, the, the context seems to fit with that understanding. And uh, so there you go. That, that That's the first, that's the opening statement of uh, Todd Clippard in the first night of our debate. Uh, hopefully the uh, rebuttal sections, when I, when I get to them eventually, uh, will go a little bit quicker than uh, tonight's uh, video. Uh, but uh, I'll just leave it at that for uh, now. And uh, until then, uh, God bless you all.